Thank, thank you for being here. Today we have the honor of having a Carlos Bianchi. You know, uh, most of you uh, know him already, I guess. Uh, he is a uh, uh, doctor in economics from uh, Rio de Janeiro, from the Federal University. He is a professor in, in Uruguay at the most prestigious university in Uruguay, uh, Universidad de la República. And he was also appointed uh, president of the, of the LALIX, of the, the Latin American uh, Charter of Globalix. And uh, so he's, I'm happy he's visiting us. He will give us a, a presentation based on, on several papers. And he will also introduce a little bit of what uh, LALIX is and what LALIX does. Uh, we organize this in the context of the UNESCO chair as well, which as you know, uh, is uh, based in, in this institute. Uh, and with the chair, we, uh, we organize seminars, we do research, we do policy advice and policy training in, in different countries. So whoever is more interested in understanding more or knowing more about what we do with the UNESCO chair, please uh, uh, get closer to me or Jorge Valverde or Mercedes Menendez or Cecilia Seri that is also beginning to work with us. We have an annual report and we've been doing a number of interesting things. Uh, the floor is to Carlos. Welcome, Carlos. Uh, you have, uh, what, 40, 45 minutes, then discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Hello, everyone. I am really happy to be here. Uh, made some friends. And, uh, actually, it's my first time in Maastricht, and uh, you know, Merit uh, is one of my pet. Uh, it's very, very good opportunity. I, as Carlos said, I will present very, very briefly our coming activities in LALIX, what LALIX is and what are our next activities. Um, but that, uh, I would like to share with you some of our last research with a particular uh, vision or try to discuss it from the Latin American perspective. Oh, okay. I... Oh, if you can stay there, people can show you to see you in the camera. Because that is a camera. So okay, perfect. Okay. Don't move. I will step in. Mercedes was my Uruguayan boss, and not is my Dutch boss, and I, I am happy to that. Okay, Lalix, as Carlo said, is the Latin American chapter of Globalix. I'm sure that you know well know what Globalix is. Rasmus is member of the board of Globalix and many professors from Merit have been involved in, in Globalix. We are working since 2011. We have a network with around 150 researchers in the whole region, actually relatively concentrated in the biggest countries or in the more developed countries. Um, we have organized a number of conferences, published 10 books and some special issues during this year. Uh, we want to strength, strengthen the, our achievements. We are very happy. We think that uh, LALIX has been consolidated as academic reference in the region, but we in the last year, due to the pandemic, COVID pandemic, and some political change issues or problems in Latin America, we have lost some regularity in our activities. Then we want to add, we want to recover regularity in the activities, increasing the contact with the Latin American diaspora. This is one of the particular interests to be here. And also try to strengthen the linkage with the other leaks of Globalix, the regional chapter from Africa, Asia, Europe to these are 
our main uh, strategic lines. And I would like to invite all of you to our next conference on PhD Academy, which have at least a preliminary title of Innovation for Development in Latin America, Democracy for Environmental, Economic, and Social Sustainability, will, will be in Rio at the Institute of Economics of the Federal, Federal University. Then this is a very interesting academic space to exchange and learn. And also, believe in me, Rio is a very interesting place for life. Then we expect to uh, have a big conference, call for papers, and the participation in the academy will be open soon. Any question, I will stay here. I'll listen and tomorrow, <coughs> all day. I, any interest, I am able, I'm very interested to exchange and try to promote new activities with you. Thank for that, Ned. Uh, I will switch to the presentation of our research. Oh, so. Okay, as uh, so. Uh, as Carlo said in the presentation, I will share with you, uh, rather than a paper, a sort of uh, research line or the recent result of our research line that we have conducted in the Institute, in the Institute of Economics, the UDLR, about we have called uh, Developmental Challenge for Middle Income Countries with focus in Latin America, in particular from the perspective of structural change, trying to cover both supply and demand side uh, approach. This is the outline. I will try to present this in within the general question that guide our curiosity. And after that, present briefly some results that are already published. Uh, I would like to concentrate in the point four, which is our ongoing work on income and power distribution and structural change in middle income, in middle income countries. Okay, why we study the middle income trend and why from Latin America? This question is because some former professor from uh, Latin America, actually uh, professor that was my professor and our, our, our reference for us, used to say that, okay, you are studying middle income trend, it's just a new world for a old problem. What is true? For Latin America is trapped around the middle as part of its historical developmental process. Recently, after uh, the last, uh, I find here. Or, uh, recently, after the last commodity boom, Latin America experienced a, a singular period that, uh, with economic growth and social inclusion, but it was it rebel will be based only or dependent on commodity boom, on the export price to support social and economic development. Uh, after the, the commodity boom, economic structure remained little diversified, oriented to a highly, highly volatile market, and it's revealed the fragility of the distributive cycles in Latin America. Then Latin America seems to be effectively trapped in a historical problem, which we, what 
we think that the, the concept of middle income trap can be useful for us to capture the problem of development as a problem of multiple traps, interrelated traps that can be described of a sort of stasis or locking process that block the developmental project. I want to address it from both a, a traditional or a perspective focus on structural change based on traditional contribution of Latin American structuralists, Indonesian Petrian economics, and techniques from complexity, economic to complexity, but also with a normative starting point that Latin American development challenge are related to many, many dimensions. One well-known dimension are catching up process. Catching up process in several experience, Asian experience during the 20th century, European experience in the 19th century, US experience, have been conducted without environmental restriction in mind or under some authoritarian process. This is not normative acceptable. Then the main question is how to conduct the structural change which involves conflicts under a democratic condition. What we mean by middle income trap as a first step, it is mostly uh, an empirical regularity, an empirical pattern in modern capitalism when countries achieve middle income, uh, middle income threshold experience or usual experience slow down in the economic growth. It is due to <clears throat> uh, a double constraint related to competitiveness. Uh, middle income countries are not able to compete by price and we're not able to build capabilities to compete by quality, innovation, as you will know. Now, ma, we departing from this general starting point and this simple and empirical definition, we try to ask these three main research questions. First, try to identify effectively what empirical mechanisms operate in the trapping the yeah, middle income threshold. Second, try to identify varieties or uh, different trajectories of middle income countries, accepting that it is possible that the trapping situation is a common phenomena, but it should not hidden the, the, the diversity, the heterogeneous trajectories. This question, we think that was also answered in this paper that was published. I will present very briefly this result to concentrate in the preliminary result of the third question. Thinking in this idea of increasing challenges for national development, what's role for distributive democracy and to what extent this is a mistake, it's not economic and policy distribution. I think it's power and income distribution favor structural change. To identify this situation, we use, there are a lot of ways and measure in the, the paper published in Nitro Economica last year, we discuss different methods and Finally, use a relative measure developed by Wu et al, who consider as middle, et, sorry, countries trapped in the middle, those countries that remain at least 40 years in between the 10 and the 55% of the use income per capita measured by power uh, purchase parity. Using this method, we identified these countries that remain in the middle income threshold at least for 40 years. And, and you can see, we observe a strong presence of Latin American countries. The old uh, story that Latin America seems to be the middle class of the world 
seems to be uh, observed. Mm -hmm. Using a sort of Keynesian approach, we test demand constraint and identified a demand side trapping mechanism related to the export margin. This mm -hmm. try to capture or improve the traditional uh, measure of the uh, term of trade, uh, uh, classical explanation of the Latin American uh, growth problem are related to the progressive uh, deterioration of term of trade due to our specialization in natural resource based commodities. We try to improve these measures using a simple measure of export margin and you, uh, testing by panel data techniques, we observe that effectively mid countries or sorry, trapped countries depend on a standard condition, depend on a standard price to grow while high income countries or fast growing countries and fast growing countries can grow without special uh, standard price. It's corroborate uh, the existence of a mechanism associated with the trapping situation and the standard condition, a classic explanation of the Latin American structuralist approach. Actually, uh, Gabriel Porcili, who visited you some time ago, is our main reference in this way. Oh, okay. Looking for identify the mechanism from the su supply side, we use <coughs> what is well known nowadays as uh, economic complexity indicators. This is the S curve, the S curve developed by Hartman, Dominic Hartman from the uh, Sherman friend, colleague, working now in the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, uh, Flavio Pinheiro from Portugal. They develop these measures and the graphic tools, the S curve, who uh, we in, in in this graphic we have the classic economic complexity index that I know you well know. It's measure the relative complexity of products produced by countries in the Product space and what they what we call the indicator raw, which try to measure the using density measures the probability to move for more complex uh, and unrelated <clears throat> more complex products that are unrelated to the current productive structure in this country. Then can I move to here? <laughs> then we use the economic complexity index as a measure of related diversification and the raw indicator as unrelated diversification and moving along the S curve as a measure of as approximation to structural change. We use these indicators, the raw indicator and the complexity indicators, both to estimate the su supply side uh, determinant of trapping situation, and also to track in what we call varieties of middle income trap. Mm -hmm. Trying to track in the different trajectories of middle income countries. First, we interact both our demand side uh, mechanism, the margin, export margin, uh, with the um, four uh, trapped countries and not trapped countries, and complexity indicators with the export margin, but also for trapped countries and not trapped countries. This Estimation show that effectively uh, the 
as the economic gets more complex, demand constraints relax. Then the complexity of the productive structure operates as a sort of way to uh, overcome the traditional demand side restriction that middle income countries uh, face. However, as you can see, or I know, I don't know, I'm not sure if you can see because it's too little. Uh, the, what the raw indicator, what is an indicator of unrelated diversification, doesn't have a direct impact on growth, on the probability to overcome the middle income trap. Conversely, it has a negative impact. It all Oh, uh, only has a positive impact when we interact it with the complexity index. I will come to that now when present the tracking make varieties. Then, until here's the first part on the determinant of middle income trumps. Now, I will present what we call the middle income trap varieties. Uh, try to discuss and particularly interesting to know your ideas, criticisms about this idea of income distribution and what we call the varieties of middle income trap. A simple history or presentation of the method. We track using the this instrument or this graphical tool with complexity, related diversification, and unrelated diversification in this period between 1964 and 2017. The observed that Germany is in a virtuous loop of high complexity, and they don't have many options of new products, more complex new products that they don't already produce. Conversely, we observe that in this period, Asian countries like China or Republic of Korea have moved along the school, showing what is a well-known historical process of structural change. But when we analyze the Latin American countries, sorry, I introduced Uruguay, not representative of, but uh, it's a nationalist bias. But if you show this is, or at least we think that this is a good graphical representation of a trapping situation, rather than the Latin American countries are in positive uh, values of the complex index, but they move in a uh, go and back, go and back, and in low levels of unrelated diversification. Hence, we ask for to what extent we can find a heterogeneous situation within the trapped countries or the trapped in the middle countries. As you can see, this is a uh, the colorful uh, dots are the middle income countries trapped in the middle. These countries are, are clustered in the left side with mostly with low values of uh, our relative diversification process. And it suggests that a limit for scape of the middle income trends is break down the past dependent trajectory related to the productive structure. Using cluster analysis, we identify three groups, what we call MIT-1, MIT-2, and MIT-3, MIT in Spanish. MIT is not a good translation. Uh, black uh, triangles are the cluster one, who the cluster two and red cluster three. Cluster one are countries that 
are in present along the whole period, negative values of, comp of complexity and negative values of uh, unrelated diversification are, co are countries that present a productive structure very similar with low income countries and strong dependent of natural resources. But these countries, when you study the particular economic history, have uh, conducted or initiated some processes of structural change or public policies oriented to structural change, but were reversed by early the industrialization process. The cluster two, we call erratic trajectories of median complexity. Rather than low values of complexity, these countries in our view are, car are characterized by this, what we call erratic detours. This is a concept coined by the Korean professor Keun Lee, the detours to the development. Using the example of Korea, Professor Lee said that they have taken a detour against the market signals that make possible the process of a structural change. We try to simplify the process of Latin America with this expression of erratic detours. Latin American countries, and in particular, these big countries of Brazil, Argentina, have initiated this uh, process, but go back. A similar process is observed, uh, I, I would like to observe it, for South Africa too. A relatively diversified uh, countries that cannot maintain a structural change trajectory. And we observe finally what we call the clean bit the ladder uh, cluster group. Nine, nine countries that seem to be escaping the middle income trend with a straightforward trajectory rather than erratic trajectory. But this is our countries that are obviously based on, well, this is at least three type of countries here, the East European countries, Asian countries, and Mexico. I honestly think that Panama is a statistical, uh, uh, it's just an uh, effect. But these countries using this indicator have present some limitation, seem to escape the middle income trap. These countries are uh, participate in dynamic market, uh, like Asian countries, North America, uh, uh, Asian market, North American market, European Union market, and participate as our export-led manufacturing, mostly based on relatively labor cost, uh, cheaper labor cost. However, if you look for studies that analyze in deep the situation in this country, it, all of almost of that all then sign out that there are several problems for sustainability on this process. Okay. Until here, we can characterize the middle income trap as the inability to claim the highest threat of the structural change, the inability to move along the S curve. Why is so difficult? Why? We are now, in, as my uh, former professor said, study once again the same topic that our referent study in the 60s, the 70s, and now. Uh, it's so difficult because it's, it's risky, it's challenging, and it's costly. Moving, sorry, moving back the path dependence in the trajectory supposed to go against the market signal and go to renounce to uh, short, uh, short runs revenues. And of course, 
you need a strong political coalition to support this process. Asian countries have been, have been based, but we have expert here in Asian countries, was based this process on a strong political coalition. European countries are involved in European policies, uh, not only national policies, and Latin American countries have historically faced several problems to define strategic lines and select what cost, what political cost. Our question then, and this is a very, very preliminary result, is this is a problem of capabilities, to build capabilities, of distributed capabilities. Latin America has been, and I think that is even uh, the most inequal region in the world. Maybe this that strong coalition is, cannot be based on, or cannot be uh, building on base of inequal power distribution and income distribution. We have a, a, a main doubt I was talking with Mercedes yesterday. This is a normative assumption rather than empirical assumption. We will test if this normative assumption make any sense. Uh, trying to analyze this or answer this research question, the literature review is hard. We have a, a lot of uh, background on the relationship between economic growth and income distribution. We know that it's a nonlinear and process of the controversial relationship. Many studies try to or corroborate the Kuznetsian hypothesis about the inverted U-shaped curve. But we have relatively, we have found almost no background that analyzes the middle income trend and income distribution. To what extent we can relate this process. And we try to approximate or address this process of this idea of income distribution as an indicator of distributed capabilities. In previous work, we think that we identified the relation between productive structure and trapping situation, how productive structure operate in the demand side mechanisms. And we try to answer now this question. Yesterday, Tommaso said something that warned me. With, and I agree absolutely with you that uh, complexity economics, or this way of complexity economics, sometimes have a likely assumption of national capabilities can be observed as revealed by productive strategy. Uh, a way to approximate to this idea of national capabilities as distributed capabilities, we with, with think that could be try income distribution or other form of political distribution, power distribution, operationalized by democracy or quality of democracy. Go back to our indicators, our preliminary results. There are there is some relationship between income distribution and complexity. Seeing for Asian experience, we saw that. Uh, I I think that you cannot uh, see, but triangle is the end of the period and square the beginning. But you can see that China as everybody will know, experienced an increase on income inequality, while 
sophisticate or gain complexity in its economy. Conversely, Korea is a unique experience or seems to be a unique experience of structural change maintaining are quite low uh, income inequality. So disposable shini is a bad name for uh, shini index box taxes. Uh, the shini indices calculated over the disposable income. Oh, sorry, good question. I forgot. It's the same, 1964, 2017. Thank you. Well, we look for the, the same periods. Good point, Mercedes. We see this relation for middle income trapped countries. We observe a sort of Keynesian process. What we call Tester One, uh, countries trapped in, in the bottom of complexity show up a uh, trend line, a positive trend line relation. Uh, really, uh, in the relation between the Shini index and the complexity economics index, while it's turn negative for cluster two and three. However, inside the clusters, we observe a uh, enormous, a uh, big heterogeneous situation. I, I will just say something about Latin American countries. Uh, Brazil experience showed an uh, increase in economic complexity during this time, as is expected, maintaining the same level of inequality, but a very high level of economic inequality around 0 0.5 of index. This is lower than South Africa, it's higher than Argentina, and of course it's lower than Peru. But in these two clusters, we are observing this process always in very, very high levels of inequality. It seems that the relation between inequality and complexity is not easy to observe a pattern, at least a clear pattern here. what we call mid, uh, cluster three, uh, climbing the ladder. We have uh, two groups that are clearly differentiated. The former socialists in Eastern Europe, departing from very, very low inequality levels, have gained complexity and increased inequality, but remain below 1.3 or 1.35. While uh, Mexico and Asian countries are sorry, in the same uh, values of complexity, but in very, uh, in, in highest, very highest income, yes. Uh, on the left panel, how reliable are the income distribution before Mexico and Mexico? Uh, I don't no. know. Uh, sure the PR your, your question is valid for almost for all middle income countries. How, your, I, I agree with your question, but it's, it's a limitation for all middle income countries, at least for uh, former socialist countries, uh, of course, for uh, African and Latin American countries. One of the best uh, statistical, national statistical system in Latin America, as the Argentina was, was almost destroyed some years ago. We deal with statistical problem in all middle income countries. But I would guess these low values for correlation or to a great extent. Sorry? To a great extent, correlation. They exist because of a strong 
Yes. Just like the grain harvest should be big, the statistics will show that the grain harvests are big and the income distribution is. Yes. Uh, so I would, you know, this the rise, the huge rise that we see there, maybe because of the removal of the fairy tale. Uh, yes. In any case, they they are still in in relatively low and very low inequality levels for middle income countries. I, I, I agree, it's possible that it is a statistical effect, maybe a ideological bias statistical effect, but the socialist countries were poorest, poorer and equal than uh, Western countries. It uh, has, I think that makes sense with the economic history of these countries. Okay, uh, in any case, we don't observe a clear pattern about the relationship between income distribution and complexity economics. We, our first econometric uh, test, we use a uh, order profit model trying to test to what extent income distribution explain the likelihood to escape the middle income trap or to move to a sort of upgrading within trapped situation. We observe first the probability to move from cluster one to cluster two, cluster two to cluster three, and cluster three to escape the, the middle income trap. As you can see, our results are still very poor or uh, not right, so rich, but we observe, we observe a positive effect of inequality on the probability to move from cluster one to cluster two, and a negative effect of inequality to escape of middle income trap. This, uh, of this relationship is also observed for the share of natural resources, so a measure, an approximation of the dependence of natural resource, showing or it seems to corroborate a sort of Keynesian process where inequality have a positive effect at the initial uh, phase, but it is not a historical process because it's the same period. Countries trap it in the bottom of the middle income, the uh, trap shows that they, will, they have a positive effect of inequality to move to the, mid, the middle of the middle of the trap. But this effect going negative. And we don't observe or still don't observe effect of democracy stability. I present just a result we use if you are as you observe, this uh, we collect information from many databases, and all of these present some weakness and some strength. For democracy, we use uh, measures of Sean Garin, a researcher from Arizona State University, who developed a measure of uh, stability of democracy and plurality of the system. As far as we know, um, asking for political scientists, this is the best or one of the best measures to approximate distribution of political power, of power. Further steps. First, I really want to hear your impression and criticism. We will explore some alternatives trying to address this idea of national capabilities through the distribution of power or welfare. We consider using other form of, of income distribution as social expenditure, but we have pro statistical uh, lacks in many countries about social expenditure. We are looking for good measure of other dimension of inequality, 
we are trying to build a measure of gender inequality, which is not easy for this period of this country. And we have tested some interactive effects between democracy, quality democracy, this measure uh, developed by Professor Guerin, and different uh, income distribution variables. But this has not based still the, the test of our discussion with political scientists. This is our ongoing research. And I am uh, uh, good time. I think so. Yes, I think so. Perfect. Thank you very much. from the audience and also from the, from the online too. There is a question from Barbara Pryor. Yes. Um, I stay here. Excellent. Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, thank you very much. It's a little bit hard to hear you, Mercedes, but I think you asked me to uh, ask my question. Thank you very much for, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Um, let me ask you a, a somewhat technical question. Um, I have cold feet if you uh, pull these ECI indices because ECI, in my understanding, is really a dimensionless kind of indicator. It's, it's actually uh, an eigenvector of a complicated matrix and so on. So I don't think that we can pull those over time because there's no fixed unit in which you measure ECI. That depends on the particular structure of each individual matrix in each individual year. Uh, and, and all of your diagrams in the, in the latter half of your presentation seem to be doing exactly that, pooling ECI values and drawing regression lines through them. I really have cold feet with that. Uh, thank professor is uh, very nice uh, uh, good to find you uh, I have the honor to have you as professor in the global X academy one century ago when I was young uh, uh, I have read your paper uh, criticized this measure with the, uh, another colleague from him that I, I never remained a the name, sorry. Uh, I think that the, the use of this indicator is problematic. Uh, yesterday at the dinner, we talked about with Carlo, uh, Tommaso, Mercedes, uh, but uh, this is problematic and we need improve this uh, this indicator this is uh, an indicator that have as you can write in some papers many limitations but it have two uh, strong uh, two, two, two strengths one is the availability of data about export which in Latin American countries and in the Middle income countries is particularly relevant due that the reasonable background, theoretical and empirical background on the relevance on the demand constraint, the standard demand constraint. The other, uh, the other strength is that it seems a good correlation with several uh, economic outcome series. Then I agree with your criticisms on the bill on, on the inside the indicators. We test, we run several uh, algebra tests to try to improve this this measure, and we are very very interesting to follow discussing whether measure for complexity or rather than complexity to approximate a structural composition of our economics in a dynamic way, uh, which we need to be empirically 
feasible. Yeah, if I just may follow up very quickly, you know, my point is not about a criticism of the complexity thing. I that's another debate that we can talk about sometime later. My point is, if if we accept complexity, we should we should accept it in its definition as it is. And I don't think the definition of complexity allows for an intertemporal comparison. It's like you are measuring GDP in dollars and in uh, in euros, and you're comparing them. Yes, I, uh, I know your, your point in, in your papers. Uh, complexity as measured by using the matrix in intertemporal way, the matrix of product, you, I think that you can assume that it is a good measure of the position of the paper in relation to the probabilities to move to work related or unrelated, more or less diversified economies. And in spite of uh, your criticism on the measure that I agree, and actually I try to learn about these criticisms, uh, it's described very well in the process that we, in, in, in terms of Professor Nelson, we have a lot of appreciative knowledge about the evolution of Latin American economies in this sort of go and back process. But we have little empirical knowledge or formal knowledge about this. Then, even though the, the criticism to the uh, measure, I think that, as I say, uh, uh, is, is, is true and I would like to learn about, the historical process seems to be uh, well, uh, featured by these measures. First, a quick point on the point that Bart was uh, was mentioning, just, just from uh, a technicality. I have completely with the point of Bart, and I think in your specific case, uh, there is a further issue: is that uh, you, you are using data from 1960 to 2017. Uh, there, there is an additional problem that, uh, for sure, the classification of products changes in time. Yes. So that, that, that uh, makes it uh, even less comparable in time uh, that I see this. Uh, 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 there is now, uh, however, to partially solve the problem that Bart was mentioning, there is now a um, working paper. I think it's out. I think it's out from uh, uh, some uh, researchers from Rome that showing that uh, you can actually make more comparable the series yes. in time by always adding uh, a country, a fictional country, with all ones in uh, that, that export all the products. Mm -hmm. So that the, so that the, all the values of complexity becomes uh, com compared to that of optimal country. This is uh, already published. Yeah, I, I believe it's, it's out in archive as a working paper. Are you concerned? Yeah, or... Yes, of course. Okay. I, I, okay. Yes, for sure. But this this was, I would say, to, to, to add to the point to the point. Um, as a as a as a question, I wanted to ask you something. That, might might look a bit uh, uh, provocative, but but it's uh, <laughs> I, I swear it's a real point. Um, I completely agree with the mechanism that you are describing in, in the in your presentation: uh, the demand side, the, the external valuation, even the income the, the income inequality side. In that. I have, a, however, a doubt that is something specific to middle income. In the sense that the kind of mechanism that you are describing, I see them in Italy now, that is a high income economy. Yes. I see most Asian economies that uh, I had some, of course, China and India are very scared about the middle income trap. They asked several times for analysis and they are not slowing down. I mean, they are, there is no, they, you don't observe any specific characteristic of middle income trap for any country other than Latin America. Even the, the examples that you are making now, Poland and Hungary, I would have doubts to put them as middle income trap uh, since uh, there are countries that uh, 
since 2000 to now, they grew more than 5% every year. I mean, which kind of gap is it? I mean, they were poor countries. It took 40 years to, to grow to high income. By the way, both Poland and Hungary are now classified as a high income trap country. I mean, do, do you believe that there is a middle income trap or there is a Latin American trap? Maybe related to the cumbersome neighbor in the north. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, thank, thanks uh, again, Emanuela uh, and Bar for the methodological comments. I, I sincerely, I am sincerely, I, um, my, my, um, our Uruguayan teams and other Brazilian teams, we are trying to go in deep in discussing not only economic complexity indicator in the Hidalgo and Hausman tradition, but rather try to discuss this from other literatures, then all of these comments are welcome. And I, I, I just to say that I, I am interested to learn more. The other observation, Emmanuel, is uh, is very, very, very good. And I, I in my honest uh, perception, it is it seems to be a South American rather than a Latin American problem. Because there, there, there is a, a very good paper. Uh, it, it, it won a, a, a prize, a recognition in a, one of the first Druid conference from Jorge Katz and Mario Cimoli that distinguished two ways of development after Washington consensus in Latin America. The South, that, the South America and uh, Mexico and Central America is another. Uh, we agree. Actually, one of our points is that no, neither China nor India seems to be trapped. Uh, what, uh, one of the, uh, no slow of growth. India is still present a uh, low income indicator. Other Asian countries are since even though they remain more than 40 years in middle income threshold, they were more similar to poor countries at the beginning of our period. And Eastern European countries are a particular case that deserve particular attention. Uh, I think my, my honest answer is I think that this is a South American uh, situation, but we would like, or we are trying to use this to discuss with coin compares to us, but uh, maybe we should have a side. So, thank you. Yes, I think that we should have a side. I, I, uh, uh, please, uh, I will ask for this yeah, paper. Of course. Tomás. Yes, yeah, I think so. Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I have many questions, Carlos. Thanks a lot. So I'll, uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll stick to, to uh, just a couple. So the, the first question was the the uh, relation about the economic complexity, uh, the diversification in terms of products, and the demand elasticity, because these are basically the same thing, right? Uh, that in at least if I think back at the at the literature on demand elasticity and uh, which basically is the demand for complex goods uh, in the end they should be very strongly related. So I'm trying to understand if you're really capturing two different things or if you're capturing the same thing. Um, and the so if, I think that is you know uh, it would be very interesting to think about the Latin American case as a case in which. Uh, you actually have to develop the capabilities, which in some of the Asian successful examples, these capabilities were developed uh, in, if you want, in a forced way, but with very active uh, policies. So institutions there are extremely relevant beyond the, the well, together with inequality, but beyond inequality, and I'll get uh, to that point. And that may be a way to try to understand a little bit better what is the difference between, for a given ECI, uh, how do an Asian country and uh, a Latin American country differ? Uh, they may have the same complexity, but what is their capability to producing these goods? 
and you can think of the Mexican case or any, I mean, now you're saying South America, but I mean, it's not that Mexico is in a much better position with lots of the maquila industry, which shows export in, in high complex product, but then is there any capability for producing those products? And, and this relates to the, 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 the point of inequality. Is inequality the correct indicator? I, I mean, I understand why you're doing inequality. I'm, I'm super interested in that as well. Um, but we're talking here in terms of opportunities to contribute to those mm -hmm. technological enhancements, right? So we're really talking about the opportunities for people who may have the talents, the skills, the capabilities to access the production process as employees, as managers, as uh, uh, scientists as inventors. So is it uh, inequality or is it uh, uh, um, the, the uh, um, um, sorry, I, I can't remember the name here, but basically social transition, the ability to uh, move from a, a, a low background to, to a much more, uh, you know, a, a, back, a, a position where you can use the skills and, and capabilities, mm -hmm. which would then be again, maybe with the same inequality, you can you may have the same inequality, but you may have people moving or you may not have the same uh, uh, inequality and people st uh, stuck in, in uh, uh, low income traps within the company. Uh, thanks, thank, thank you very much, Tommaso. Uh, well, first, I, I am really happy because uh, excellent comments for, the, the opportunity to this, share these ideas. Uh, all comments are, are, are help us a lot. Uh, the relationship between the ECI and, and demand elasticity is uh, yes. It, we we have test no strong correlation statistical statistical correlation in our econometrical test, but. Theoretically, uh, substantive are a, a sort of measure of the same, by definition. Then this is, but this is, or I, I think that as we or, or usually say, this is indigenous in nature. Then we cannot. I don't know how to escape of this problem. But but it's it's, it's good to put attention on that and sign on that. Uh, well, the, your idea of compare similar ECI for Latin America and Asian countries, or I, I think that maybe for also for Eastern European countries and what are inside that, I think as a, a very good suggestion. Always for South Africa, I think that could be a good idea. We was talking about so, uh, with Ra uh, Rasmus now earlier. Uh, Um, recovering the comment of Bart and Emmanuel, I think that this should be different in the different periods of time in the neutralization process of Brazil, for example, and the Asian country regarding Asian countries in that moment. It's a, a very good idea. Thank you. Uh, to what extent is a problem of inequality or the mobility between the yes uh, i don't know how we could measure mobility for these countries during this time we can talk about that um for example Excellent. certain names but yeah excellent thank you any other comments or Oh, okay. Yes, we're going to now. We're going to take some minutes to tell you that we are organizing a workshop with some papers that we will present as two uh, in a room close this, this one. So, if you want to show, uh, there are some presentations we sent in program some couple of days ago. Uh, but uh, all of all are welcome to. To come to because we're going to, to continue with this discussion. Uh, some of the papers are more connected with Latin American topics, but there are a lot of other things. So, all of us are welcome to uh, uh, Very, very difficult and interesting topic that I am so. 
Yeah. 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 As, as a Latin American citizenship rather no. than <laughs> but then, uh, thanks so much, Carlos. Oh, thank you. Inspiring and to keep on working. So thanks so much for coming, and when we finish this, thank you, thank you a lot. Uh, well, uh, we have my contact. We are in touch, and we are open to exchange with everyone. Thank you.